So uh, he said, my, my, our company culture, I'll tell you something. My son walked into work one day, and he came home, and he said, Dad, I want to do what you do. I said, you do, bud? And as, it was like a proud fatherly moment. I'm like, that is awesome. You do? And I said, why? And he said, because all you guys do is play at work all day. I love the fact you guys have scooters and the Nerf guns there. I'm like, no, 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 buddy. We do like computer stuff there. And he's like, no, you guys just play, and then you have free food. I thought that was awesome. I'm like, dude, you're eight years old, aren't you? You don't get it. But you know what? I'll just make you think that's what work is. So now, it was a little like Disneyland at times. The culture was. Sometimes I felt like it was too much like recess. And I had to tell our employees, our team members, I'm like, you guys, recess is over. Let's get back to work. We got work to do because it was fun. And that's what happens. And when you build a culture, it is a lot of fun. But I don't want to talk about a lot. I hate talking about me. That's why these entrepreneur lecture series are actually very difficult for me. Uh, because they say, come in and talk about your successes. Come in and talk about you. And you know what? I kind of have a hard time with it. I have a difficulty with it. So we're going to talk a little bit about us. We're going to talk about life. We're going to talk about some things that, yes, maybe I was part of. And maybe I participated in. Not maybe, I did participate in. But I want to talk about some things that I've learned. And with the learnings, I hope that you guys can walk out of this class today and say, wow, I actually learned something at school. Go figure. I'm paying for this education. You guys are paid customers right here sitting in front of me. So you're a hard audience because you're tough. It's Monday. It's the afternoon. You're going, listen, we're paid and I want to get my, we're paid customers and I want to get my money's worth. So I hope we can get your money's worth. So one thing I hope that we do today is this just doesn't become a check off the box, market, get her done, hurry, get the, the uh, attendance done in the beginning, and attendance, do you do it at the, at the end also? No, you make sure they don't leave, because you have to write a one-page thing on it, right? No, you don't anymore? <laughs> it's a quiz? Okay, I'll make sure I like, bring up some fun things. Okay, this quote right here, it's kind of hard to see on here, and I apologize, I took this picture, my brother made this sign for me because I love this quote. It's Winston Churchill. He says, you make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Okay, pretty self-explanatory. What, what am I saying? What am I thinking there? Winston Churchill, what is he saying? Help me. Teach me. What is he saying? Yeah. But isn't this society all about me? Isn't it a whiffum society? What's in it for me, society? Is it not? What's in it for me? This is about me. What am I going to get? When you go in to work for an employer, what are you saying? What's one of the first things you're wondering? Well, how much are you going to pay me? Show me the money. How much are you going to pay me? That's what you're wondering, are you not? Yeah, that's what I wonder a lot, too. We wonder that. It's, it's normal. It's a natural human tendency to feel that way, to act that way. But like Winston Churchill says, it's, we make a life. Life is much more than what we get. Life is about what we give. Now, the napkin. Sorry, skip forward. Suspense. It's going to kill you, I know. So I am sitting in this very classroom, entrepreneur lecture series, just like you, 13 years ago. I'm sitting in this class, and I'm going, wow, this is awesome. Some of the coolest individuals are coming in, and I'm sorry to ruin that for you, but for me, that's what it was. Some of the greatest individuals coming in and business leaders, and I thought, this is sweet. They are good guys and good gals. They are smart and telling us their stories. It was powerful and inspired me. There was one individual. He walks in. He starts telling us a story, and I've shared this story before in the lecture series, but I'm going to share it with you guys, okay? So he's sitting there, and he starts telling a story about his business, about how it's succeeding, how it's doing amazing things. It's ramping up. He's growing rapidly. There's a guy that comes into town that wants to buy his business. He comes into town. I'll never forget the story. And they're at a restaurant, and they're talking about the business. They're sitting there talking about it talking about it. 
talking about it. And he goes, I want to buy your business. And he said, okay. Slides him a napkin and he goes, name the price. So the guy that wants to buy the business gets his pen out, writes it, slides the napkin back, guy unfolds it. Okay, let's do it. $100 million. He wrote on the napkin. $100 million. And I'm sitting in the seat 13 years ago and I'm going, holy cow, that's going to be me. That's going to be me. And I seriously, I closed my eyes and I envisioned it. And I saw myself right there. And I'm like, I see it. I totally see it. I'm going to create this experience. I've got it. I visualized it right then. It was done. I already had the money spent. It was done. Okay, I didn't have a spend, but you know what I'm trying to say. But I visualized it at that moment. I knew it was going to happen. I'm like, I, it's just, it's done. I visualized it. So, many years later, something happened, and I'll finish the story about the napkin. I had a napkin experience. It was awesome. But let me take you back of how I got to that napkin experience. So let me walk you through what happened. July 17, 2002, okay? I get in the old bad girl. This car right here was called the bad girl. Why? Because it was from Arizona. It was my 1977, 1978 GMC 454 Suburban. Every gas station I saw, I had to fill up with gas. <laughs> that thing was a killer. And I had two kids, and we had that car and a little Honda Accord, and I was starting my business. Every time you drove in the bad girl, you smelled like gasoline. So I kind of started using the excuse, honey, sorry, I can't take the bad girl today. I have to take the Honda. I'm meeting with this guy. Okay, I can do it. So what does she do? She has to bundle up our two kids. I mean, it is like fur coat season, and you can see your breath in the car because there's no heater. The heater wasn't working. And in the summer, the AC didn't work. Anyhow, that's another story. But I love the bad girl. I left a company with a partner. We had a company that we had about 110 sales reps, and we were doing stuff door to door, and the business imploded. It actually, we went out of business. So I with my partner, we folded the business, and I said, let me take half the furniture, and you take half the furniture, and we call it good, and we'll move on. You got, you got your job. I'm going to go start a business. What are you going to start? He go, and I said, I don't know. i got to figure it out. So I loaded up the bad girl. I had $2,000 to my name, and I said, honey, I know we're building a house right now. I thought this last business was going to succeed, and it didn't. But I need to take this money because I need to start this new business. So I loaded up this Suburban, and I put in a bunch of IKEA desks that I had. I had three, three desks and a couple chairs and this little sofa chair. And I packed it in there, and I went up to Thanksgiving Point and saw an office. And I said, I want to sign a lease. And he said, great. you got to sign a two-year lease. I'm like, a two-year lease? Are you kidding me? I've got, and I don't want to tell him this, but in my mind, I'm like, I've got $2,000. I can't commit to two years. You're crazy. And I said, you know what? I don't do that kind of stuff. I'll sign a six, I'll sign a month to month lease. And he said, you can sign a six month lease because you're not going to last more than six months. Dude, I don't know about you, but anytime anyone talks that kind of trash to me, I say, bring it on. Dude, I will show you, Mr. Principal. And he looked like a principal there at the office. <laughs> like, like, I felt like I needed a bathroom hall pass every time I saw him. Like, whoa, hey, just got to go to the bathroom, you know, every time I was in my office. <laughs> I wanted to prove to him that I could actually succeed. So I signed the lease. I have one client. It's Ancestry.com. Anyone have heard of Ancestry.com before? Yeah. Anyone heard of MyFamily.com before? Okay, same company, right? Ancestry.com. They came to us, my company before, right before I left, and they said, we want leads. And I said, great. I said, we can do leads. And I said, but we want a $10,000 prepayment. They said, we don't prepay. And I said, well, we don't do leads for you. We won't find people potentially interested in your product unless you pay us, prepay us. And in my mind, I'm like thinking, I have no idea how to do leads. And I don't know why I'm asking for a prepayment, but it just kind of seems natural. I'm going to ask for a prepayment. So after a couple months, they finally prepay me $10,000. 
I go to my partner, this is my last company, right, before we folded it, and I said, Ben, they prepaid us. He said, great, how are we going to do it? And I said, I don't know. But I got a group up in Salt Lake that can do it for us. So we go up to the guys in Salt Lake, and in two and a half months, these guys generated six free trials, meaning they generated six leads for Ancestry. So I want you guys to do the math real fast with me here. You've heard this before, story before, right? I want you to do the math. Six times $15. They were paying us $15. How much money did we make? $90. We paid these guys $12 up in Salt Lake. How much did we net? $18. We were biggie sizing our meals that night. We had $18 to spend, but we still had $9,910 to pay back to them. They gave us a call and they said, we want our $9,910 back. I hang up the phone, I go to my partner, they want their money back. And he goes, we gotta give it back. And I said, Ben, we don't have it. We gotta figure this out. I said, you go focus on the sales team. I'm gonna focus on figuring out this online marketing. I gotta drive traffic to Ancestry.com. I gotta figure this out. So I locked myself in my office and for six months I started generating free trials. Meaning, I was driving traffic to Ancestry.com site. Does that make sense? And they would pay me to find people who wanted to sign up for their free 14-day trial service. So in, in, within six months, we, had, we became their number two acquisition leader. We were acquiring more free trials for Ancestry, meaning we were bigger than any other affiliate, any other group out there besides one group out of California, and they were paying us for it. So I go to my partner at that time, and I say, Ben, let's do this. And he said, no, we gotta do the sales. And I said, no, let's do this. And uh, he's such a great guy, I love him to death. And uh, he decided, you know what, let's separate. You can go build that up. So I took Ancestry.com, $2,000, and the bad girl, and I signed that lease for $750. I had to pay the first month, and I had to pay the security deposit. I had how much money left? $500 left, $750, $750. I had $500 left. Holy cow, here we go. I had to do this. So we started building up that side of the business. I soon realized, that you know what, this is a numbers game. Online advertising at that time was, I wanna say it's a little bit new, but it was newer. It was 2000, 2001, then 2002. I started this business in 2002. And it was just starting to take off, starting to roll. So we became their number two acquisition leader. We started growing rapidly. We were doing about $10 million in business a year. And August 28, 2008 hits, and we were doing leads for schools, for a lot of schools across the U.S., but primarily through our call floor. We were doing it through a call center, and then we would send those leads off to them, kind of an old school way of doing it. Okay, I'm talking about me. I'm sorry I'm talking about the story, though. I'm trying to give you a perspective of the story because I want to get back to the napkin experience, which was awesome. And that's going to be you right here, sitting here. I want you to visualize it. August 28th. 2008. Someone read this quote out loud for me, will you? Leonardo da Vinci. Who wants to read it for me? Got it right there in the middle. It has long since come to my attention that people of accomplishment rarely step back and let things happen to them. They went out and happened to things. They happened to things. They made things happen. Instead of just sitting back and letting things happen to them, they were proactive and they let things happen or they made things happen and not let things happen to them. Now, August 28th, our largest client calls us up and they cancel our contract. 35% of our business, three and a half million dollars of business. They say, we don't want your leads anymore. You can't do it that way. In fact, because you're using your call center, you cannot talk to our prospective students any longer. So we cancel it. I'll never forget that day. It was a defining moment in our business. Does anyone remember what happened in 2008, especially August, September, October of 2008? What happened? The crash. Big crash. What kind of crash? Like a car crash? What's that? Housing market, financial market, everything, right? Everyone started cutting back. I had preserved a certain amount of money in the bank. Thank goodness. Employees and team members at the time weren't understanding, why aren't, we, why aren't you paying us out more bonuses? I had to retain money, retain money, retain money, make sure we had a treasure chest of reserves. 
to make sure that we could survive in a moment of tragedy. And guess what? That moment happened right here. And so for you students that are in my class before, I apologize, you've heard this story before. But let me just share it. I come in the office and I said, you guys, to the team, this will define who we are. This is where we're going to grow. This is where we're going to change our business. It was tough because we spent $2 million on really building the business out, and we started building technologies. We started buying domain names up. I bought over 7,000 domains. We actually started hiring a lot of programmers, 20, 30 programmers. We moved to about 200 and, uh, no, 180 employees at the time. We started growing rapidly. I started spending as much as we possibly could because I knew it would ensure that we would build out the right um, product. This was one of our sites, classesandcareers.com. Let me just show you a quick video. Can you get up there, Mr. DJ? And, uh, and whoa, just there should be something on the bottom. No, right? There. The bottom, push play. I want to just show you real fast, just a little clip from it. Oh, you may want to turn on the volume. Maybe stop it. Maybe pause it. There we go. I know. Wait, why are you guys over there? Why are you over here? Okay. Yeah, yeah, this is tricky. All right. Cars, resources, funding, blah, blah. Sorry, no more excuses. With online school, education, it's time to be set for yourself. If I had a degree, I'd have that as well. And I'd get that book, I'd get more money. So just tell me about that. Just tell me about the amount of time, the resources, the funding, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, no more excuses. With online school, education is more flexible than ever. Your learning is key to your lifetime. Classesandcareers.com has relationships with more than 225 online and campus schools that offer 2,000 degree programs. We can help find the best school for you. Here's how it works. Choose your desired area of study. Tell us about your education and future plans. Check out the top schools we found that fit you. And once you've done all that, fill out your contact information and one of our education counselors will give you a call. Choose the best school to find the one that fits you best. A counselor will then answer any questions you have about the school, including financial aid, graduation timelines, school accreditation, and more. For additional information, visit our homepage at www.classesandcareers.com. Get matched with the school and program today. Okay, so what we did is we actually started building out our technology, started building out our web presence, and we started changing who we were it, dr dramatically. Dramatically. We went from $10 million to $22 million, $22 million that next year to $50 million to $56 million in revenue by the time we actually uh, had some type of exit. But I want to teach you, I want to, I want to tell you something about our core values. And in fact, I'm actually going to skip it. Because core values are very important, but I'm going to skip it because I feel like um, we don't have a lot of time. We get out at what time? Four? Whenever you want. Whenever we want. Okay, but I want to let you guys out a little bit early because that always means that, like you guys get pumped when you go out early. So yeah. anyhow, um, let me just tell you, core values are very important to us. Typical core values at companies are what? When we started talking about culture, Scott was talking about culture. Culture, when you build a company, isn't a ping pong table. It's not a foosball table. It's not, hey, guess what? We, we feed our people pizza every month. That's culture. What is culture? It's your beliefs. It's who you are. It's how people feel when they walk in. It's about their career path. It's who they're going to become, who they want to become, and helping them achieve those goals. Now, our core values weren't core values that you typically see. Core values of, you know what, integrity, honesty. What are other core values you hear that are typical? Not that they're bad, but you kind of forget them. What are some different ones you hear? Come on, what's that? Work, work ethic. Oh, I just get emotional when I hear that. It's just touching. It just goes to my inner soul, right? What else? What are some other words? Unity. unity. Yeah, unity. Oh, we're so unified because we put a word up there. It says unity. We're close. Okay, what else? Well, there's teamwork. Yes, teamwork. And you see those teamwork posters, right? Those old posters. Perseverance. You know, you're like, Oh my gosh, if I see one more of those words, I'm going to gag myself with a ski pole. You know what? It's just not going to work. And so we saw that, and we're like, I want meaning. I want depth. I want something that means something. 
So help me. So what do we do? We had stories behind our core values. So I said I wasn't going to show up, but as I said, my, gagged myself with a ski pole, I thought I might as well show you what I mean by that. So here's one of our core values. It's keep the cattle moving. And you tell me what this means. In my early years as a child, and later as a young man, I spent every summer on a 50,000 acre cattle ranch in Northeast Arizona. My father was a cattle rancher, and even today, being around cattle brings back uh, some pretty incredible memories of uh, being a gardening and steward of both the animals and the land that we own. Then we swim my father would buy urine and steers. And uh, we'd go around the country and we'd buy them. And during the entire summer, we would herd and maintain those cattle. And I'd go around and gain several hundred pounds during the uh, summer and early fall. Um, but summer's in, we live back down in Phoenix. And sometime in mid to late October, uh, we, my two brothers and I would travel up to the ranch with my dad. And we would So we gather the cattle, and uh, uh, on the night before they were to be weighed and sold, we, we transferred them to a pasture we called our chicken pasture, which was near the house, but it was kind of much smaller than the other pastures, and it had no water in it. It eventually had no water because the day that you uh, sold the cattle, they were to be weighed without uh, having a drink. So, uh, yeah, we that morning we'd get up early and have to go into the house and get up slowly because one, we didn't want to run or go too fast so they would lose weight. But number two, they couldn't have water, which would cause them to gain artificial life. That morning, I can recall coming up to a spot where there had been a recent storm and uh, there was actually a little water in the floor and a small lake there. And uh, I remember riding over to my dad and I said, Hey, Dad, who is Go real slowly by his water bottle. The cat would get a little drink. Uh, then we're getting a bad response. He said, that's son. That's not the way, son. These cattle are going to be dry. Keep the cattle moving. Um, that was a point moment for me because <clears throat> my dad taught me a great lesson. No one would have known. The buyers wouldn't have known. No one would have known except him and me and his voice. And that just wasn't the way to do things. You're not dishonest, not even quiet moments. Integrity is an important element of his life. And I, I'm glad that I knew him and that I can remember the moment to keep the cow moving and start my name. Okay, so when you see that, what goes through your mind? What goes through your mind? Give me, give me some thoughts. Yeah. Some of those words that we, kind that we integrity. integrity, honesty. What other thoughts? Anything else? Yeah. So there's meaning there, right? So my my purpose of showing that was in life. Sometimes you have to create a story so people remember. Oh, that's what we're fighting for. So part of a culture that you're trying to create is you kind of paint a picture for your people that are working with you and for you to say, this is what we're fighting for. And in fact, I can't tell you how many meetings I would hear instead of people saying, hey, integrity, guys, and honesty. They'd say, guys, we got to keep the cattle moving. You're right. we got to keep the cattle moving. It was crazy. It was weird. All of a sudden, it became a saying. It's like, hey, go Google that. Yeah, hey, got to keep the cattle moving means you got to be honest. you got to be integral in what you're doing. Now, of course, a little emotional. It's my dad. It's my grandpa with the big old fat bolo tie on. So, of course, for me, it's got purpose. It's got meaning. I love it. So, anyhow, let me just finish up a story real fast. So, there I am. We build our business up. We build the culture up. Fantastic. I mean, the team is, hands down, the best team that you could ever work with. The people that we had there were I mean, just phenomenal and that are still there are phenomenal. And uh, back in 2009, I had this impression as I was driving down I-15, Nick, hire an investment banker, meaning hire someone who can represent you to sell your business. 
This is August of 2009. Does anyone remember what August of 2008 was? The crash, the major catastrophe. One year exactly, almost to the date. I get this, this feeling, okay? And I could say it here, I definitely know what that feeling was. Something was telling me very strongly it's time to go take that step. So for 14 months, we hired an investment banker for 14 months. We went out and started selling, our, selling the business. So we did 28 presentations to 28 different businesses saying, hey, are you guys interested in buying us? It was a long process. So I'm sitting across the table with a publicly traded, well-known company. And uh, we're sitting there. I'm there with my uh, executive team. And we're meeting their team. They had already flown out, seen our company. They absolutely loved it. And uh, they, we fly back out. We sit down with them and start talking with them. And uh, the CEO goes, Nick, let's go over and talk in my office. Well, these guys go talk. I'm like, sweet, let's go talk. Um, and we go over to his office. He goes, all right, I know you got this banker that's representing you, but, representing you, but let's, come on, friends, let's talk, you and me. Let's get this deal done right now. I'm like, okay. He's about 30 years older than me. I knew he's a little bit wiser, a little bit more experienced a lot more experience, but I had to act like I had experience. And he goes, let's do this deal. I said, okay, tell me, tell me how much. Again, it was about the getting, right? <laughs> there I was, how much are you gonna pay me? How much am I gonna make per hour? But that's what I was doing. I was trying to find out what are we worth? Let's get this deal done. So he gets a blank piece of paper. He goes, all right, let's do this right here. And he writes down this number, and he slides a paper across the desk. <laughs> but no, that's what I envisioned, except it's not a napkin. <laughs> it's just a piece of white paper, a nap by 11 piece of paper. Oh my gosh, that's what happened. That's what I saw. I saw that in my class. I saw that in this class right here, the lecture series. It's happening right here. Holy cow. And he slides it across, and I look at the number, and it was, it was more than what I, that I envisioned. And I'm like, you're kidding me. And of course, I didn't want to, you know what, right there on the spot. I'm like, I couldn't. I'm like, well, all right, we'll think about it. He goes, well, Nick, no, what, what, what? And it was like, in my, in my mind, I'm like, I cannot wait to tell my dad. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I cannot wait to tell him. This is going to be Awesome. And so I'm sitting there, and we end up, he writes down even more numbers. And he goes, but if you get these numbers, we'll even pay you this much more. I'm like, those are a lot of zeros. <laughs> I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to work out, you know. And I don't know if we want to sell ourselves 100% right now. So we end up doing a different deal. I end up going with a company that's bought a part of our business, two private equity groups. And they came in and bought the business. And then a year and a half later, I stepped down, and they bought the rest of it last year, last July. So I stepped away from the business. What a great experience that was to go through. If I didn't, if we as a company didn't take the risk of going after all of it, we could have preserved our cash and tried to just hoard it and just try to protect, or we could go out there and take a risk like entrepreneurs do, because I'll tell you this right now, it's easy to take those first initial risks as a business owner but it gets harder and harder and harder to take more and more risk down the road and just as much or just as big or even bigger risk because you're trying to protect so much more. You don't have, you have so much more to lose as opposed to in the beginning, you had very little to lose. I had how much to lose at the beginning? $2,000. And then I had millions and millions of dollars to lose at the end. So you could see it was a big difference at that point. Now. My daughter and I had a beautiful experience that I want to share with you, and I want to share it through a video. Can I do that real with you? It's called 512. And this was one of our core values, actually. A lot of money. A lot of people reached out. A lot of people, actually, I didn't even know. Strangers. Strangers reaching out to me that were impacted, too, by the story of Eric and realized, yeah, I can help, too. 
And it was a domino effect. It's almost like an avalanche. It was a snowball effect that just started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the response rate was huge. And over a two day period, we collected over $64,000. $64,000 was huge, it was amazing. It was somewhat unheard of in a lot of ways. But what was the most powerful moment was one moment, that second night when I was sitting in my kitchen. My dad came home one night and he was telling us about his friend who they, they needed um, some help to help him feel better so that he wouldn't die. I was typing on my computer happened on my laptop and I was sitting there and my daughter she walked up to me. I remember I just went I went into my room and got my money and gave it to her. She said, Dad. She had something in her hand and she said, Dad, will this help your friend? Will this help him? I knew he needed it more than I did because no, I wasn't dying. And I noticed it was, it was a, some type of dollar bill and some change. It was five dollars and twelve cents. And she said, Dad, it's it's everything I have. I just thought, you know, maybe I can help him. Maybe I can help to um, keep him alive. And of course, at that moment, as a father, it's powerful. You realize maybe they are listening. Maybe they do kind of hear what you say. Maybe they are learning. Uh, it was at that moment I realized it wasn't the $10,000 I received over here or $5,000 or $100 or $300. It was that $5.12 that I knew was going to make a difference for Eric. But more importantly, it was going to make a difference for a lot of other people. I, like, if they're having a hard time and I'm not, it's just not fair. So, you know, you want to help them out in whatever problem they're having. And for that reason, that reason, that night, I set out to set up the 512 Foundation because I knew that people could give back maybe everything they have for as little as $5.12 and realize, you know what, even if it's just a little bit, but it could be everything that someone has. It can make a difference. It can make a big difference. Anyone can help out if they're willing to. That is my daughter, and uh, she is awesome. She is the absolute best. She is an angel. She was six years old, and you can imagine a little six-year-old. And I mean, it's everything she has. And she hands over $5.12. That's why, as a father, it was so emotional for me when I did receive it. And it was such a big moment in my life. And, uh, and so after, um, you know, in the last uh, year and a half, and over the last actually two and a half years approximately, we've, um, uh, we've been doing uh, some, some pretty neat things, but uh, really just trying to be stewards over what we've been blessed with. And... Uh, We've got a foundation called the 512 Foundation, and one of the things that we do is we help out uh, missionaries uh, get on their mission. Anyone been to Peru on their mission? Yeah? What mission? Trujillo. Trujillo. I love Trujillo. Been there three times last year. I love it. Puta. Where? Puta? Puta, up in north. They say uh, Trujillo's a little bit bigger than Puta. Do you believe that? There's a battle between those two cities of who's bigger. Who else went to, to Peru? Your mom is from Peru. Where in Peru? We talked about this, didn't we? Yes. Okay. Lima North. I love the Peruvian people. So my dad served a mission there many, many years ago. And uh, about two and a half years ago, he went there. Just over two years ago, he went there and he said, hey, Nick, he came back and he said, they need fire trucks. So we bought a fire truck and it's taken us almost two years to finally get it shipped over there. And uh, it's a big pain. I said, well, Dad, there's got to be a better way we can help the proving people over there. So he moved over there. and said, Dad, move over there. Figure things out with Mom. So they moved over there for four months. They lived in Trujillo. And I love it. Best weather ever, ever, right? Going in January. So we decided, and he found out, oh, my goodness, there's so many kids that want to go on a mission that can't go on a mission because they don't have the funds to pay for their medical, dental, 
and their, all their supplies. Now, the church will help subsidize and pay for their mission, but everything beforehand, they've got to figure out. So I said, let's figure that out. Let's do that. So the first year, we helped out about 400 missionaries. This year, we're on track to help out just over 2,000 missionaries in Peru. About 80% of these kids that are going out and serving now would not have served. And they're phenomenal kids. You can see here they are one of the days. They are lining up, and they're mini MTC that day, and they get all their medical supplies uh, or the medical, um, uh, medical and dental work done. They get a lot of their supplies if they need it. We have our own shoes being made there, our own shirts, our own ties. It's kind of a cool little thing. It says Cinco Doce, you know, uh, Cinco or 512 on the back. And it's kind of a fun little thing that we do there. And uh, it's been a fun experience, except I don't know Spanish. I know Romanian. So I'm trying to understand. So if you want to help teach me, I would love it. And I had a tutor. It just didn't last very long. Um, anyhow, but I will show you this. Here's a kid getting a shot. He's going, really? Do I have to do this? We've got a couple minutes. I'm going to show a quick video. That's, it says it's 11 minutes, but I'll just tell you. I'm just going to show you the first minute so you can get a feeling of it. This is Miguel, and then I gotta get back to this slide here. So um, that's Miguel, he's our director out there. You recognize those people in Piura? You recognize them? Yep. So anyway, that's taped up in Piura, but you'll see here, right here, we've got 107 missionaries at one little conference. Future missionaries going out, serving the Lord. It's powerful, it's awesome. And again, it's just it's one of those things that you know what you're doing so little, but yet you're doing so much, meaning what Miguel is doing, what my dad is doing, what these guys are doing with 512, it's absolutely unbelievable. It's powerful. These missionaries are going out serving the Lord, and it's a powerful work that's being done. So 512, what we're doing right here is we're helping out missionaries. Our goal is to have 5,000 missionaries that we're sending out every, every single year. But our goal is, is to have a sustainable model where it's actually paying for itself. So we've created some businesses down in, in, in Peru with some sugarcane fields, but also with some mines and pumps that we're using. That's a whole different story to create some revenue to help pay for all these efforts. So therefore, it's actually a sustainable model instead of us and me paying every single month for this. But it's a lot of fun. I'll tell you this, fear. I want to talk about fear for two seconds. Okay, the London Times. Alex, you remember this, right? The London Times and the London Weekly. One headline reads, housing crisis. Home prices down 40%. And the other one read, best time ever to buy. Prices down 40%. It sounds a lot happier, right? First one was like, whoa, it's crashing. Hurry up. Sell. Sell. It's crazy. The other one's saying, hey, this is the best time. Guess what newspaper sold the most? The housing crisis. Eight out of 10 people bought the negative paper. Why is that? Why is that? Help me, guys. I know it's 4.30, 4.15, but help me. Why? Fear sells. Fear sells. Why is it fear sells? We're scared. Why is it that we have so many entrepreneurs and not entrepreneurs? Because you're scared. You want, to, you want to be an entrepreneur. There's entrepreneurs, not entrepreneurs. Too many entrepreneurs. This is right here. I said, I've used this quote before, and I'm sorry it's at BYU, but I'm going to use it again because this saved me. This is Harley Davidson. It says, we don't do fear. Over the last 105 years in the saddle, we've seen wars, conflicts, depression, recession, resistance, and revolutions. We've watched a thousand hand-wringing pundits disappear in a rear view mirror. But every time, this country has come out stronger than before because chrome and asphalt put distance between you and whatever the, the world can throw at you. Freedom and win outlast hard times. And the rumble of an engine browns out or drowns out all the spin of the evening news. Five years have proved one thing, 
It's that fear stinks. And it doesn't last long, so screw it, let's ride. I loved it, I saw that, I'm like, that's it. That's how I feel. Fear stops you from doing so much. Fear will stop you from doing so many things. Don't let fear stop you. I talked to my son last night about fear. I said, Drew, who is the author of fear? You know who the author of fear is. You know who the author of fear is. I'm not even going to give him credit, but it is. He is the author of fear. The Lord and Savior and our Master does not want us to be fearful. He wants us to feel excited. He wants us to actually feel safe. But you know what? Starting your own business is fearful. It is scary, but it is possible. So don't stop yourself just because of fear, because what is the most you're going to lose? What's the worst thing that's going to happen? If you're married, maybe you have to move in with your in-laws. Okay, that's probably the worst thing. But that's not bad. In fact, I did it for a year, and it was the best thing that's ever happened to me. I absolutely loved it. It was a sweet blessing in my life. And I'll tell you this, last, last quote by Brigham Young, and then we'll get out of here. I am a steward. I told you the other day what makes me rich. It is the labor of those whom I feed and clothe. Still I do not feel that I have a dollar in the world that is mine own. It is the Lord's, and he has made me a steward over it. And if I can know where the Lord is pleased to have it appropriated, there shall it go. You guys, you guys are great. I appreciate you being here and being who you are. I can feel of your great spirit. I want you to go out there and conquer the world. Let's dominate this world together, and let's make things happen. Thank you for coming today.